Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. My name is Vivian de Tres Palacios. I'm the Digital Communications Manager for IFAP Academy. It is with great pleasure that I welcome you today to one of our webinars for Conversations with the Academy. This is part of our Value Added Programs Initiative. Today, we have a very interesting topic in vaccines development, which I'm sure everyone will be waiting to hear our panelists and speakers as well. Next slide, please. And now it's my honor to introduce the co-host for today's webinar, as well as the faculty. Dr. Seema Hader has over 25 years of experience in the pharmacoeconomics area. She is an internationally recognized expert with publications worldwide in peer-reviewed journals. She is also um, a project director, uh, has been a project director at the Interdisciplinary Health Research Group Health Economics Unit at the University of Montreal. She received her PhD as well as a master's in science from the University of Montreal in 1992 and 95, respectively. Uh, Dr. Uh, Seema Hader uh, has a very distinguished career in the pharmaceutical industry. She has worked uh, at Pfizer for over 22 years and in the area of health economics and outcomes research. Her former position at Pfizer was cluster lead for several therapeutic areas. She has been extensively presented and featured at conferences worldwide and in publications with high impact. We're very proud to say as well that Dr. Hader is also a faculty at IFAP Academy given her expertise. Next slide, please. Our other co-host for today's session will be Dr. Sandor Kerpel Fronius. He has a distinguished career in academia, clinical development, as well as the pharmaceutical industry. Dr. Kerpel Fronius is currently Professor of Clinical Pharmacology, Department of Pharmacology and Pharmacotherapy at Summerweis University in Budapest, Hungary. He has a doctor's um, diploma, as well as a doctor in um, academic sciences. Um, he has a very vast uh, career in both uh, academia, as well as clinical development, having worked at the Hungarian National Institute of Oncology. In addition to his academic activities, uh, Dr. Kropel Fronius is also currently a member of IFAP uh, and IFAP Academy Board of uh, Directors. Uh, he also was recently given the honor of Global Fellow uh, for his contribution for uh, clinical development area and pharmaceutical industry by the IFAP Academy. He is also a member of the PharmaTrain Federation. Next slide, please. And lastly, uh, we're very honored to receive Dr. Stephen Lockhart. Um, Dr. Lockhart is world renowned in the area of vaccines development, having a very distinguished career in several different pharmaceutical industries. As you can see, he held positions of seniority in, in different uh, pharmaceutical companies, including Sanofi and Pfizer. He has extensive experience in vaccines development for numerous uh, pathogens, uh, pathogenic microorganisms. Um, most importantly, Dr. Lockhart is currently the clinical lead for Pfizer BioNTech mRNA COVID-19 vaccine development. <clears throat> he manages numerous teams across Europe, US, and Australia and Japan. He is also a fellow 
of the Faculty of Pharmaceutical Medicine of the Royal Colleges of Physicians of the United Kingdom. It is my pleasure to thank them and to welcome the, both the co-hosts and the faculty to our session today. And now I would like to turn it over to the faculty who will introduce today's session. Next slide. Uh, hello, everyone, and welcome to our conversations with the Academy session. Um, so as you've heard, we're very happy to have with us today Stephen Lockhart from Pfizer, who will be leading the conversation uh, today on lessons from traditional vaccine clinical development. Um, at the end of today's session, there are three um, sort of lessons of learning or objectives that you should have accomplished. And they are, number one, you should have a better understanding of the types of immune markers and their relevance and limitations in vaccine development. Number two, you should have a greater awareness about the ways of systematically assessing safety and tolerance. And number three, you should have an increased familiarity about efficient design of efficacy studies with clinically relevant case definitions. Um, so throughout the session today, you'll have a chance to comment, ask a question, join the discussion using the chat function, and um, in addition, we will have poll questions throughout the session, and my co-host, Sandor, will be sharing the answers with you. So let's start today's conversation on vaccines with our first poll question. So, poll question one. Why is vaccination preferred to drug treatment of infection, infected patients for controlling a pandemic? So we'll wait for everybody to answer. Just giving a little more time to everyone to answer this question. Yes, I think. Yes, I think we are at one minute and I this is now the time to read the answer. 67% voted for the first question that is more effective, uh, prevention is more effective than treating infected patients. Now, this is actually the dogma of medicine, so we are not surprised. <laughs> Very important that 20 and 13% uh, and of the people also mentioned that vaccination if large population is cheaper and uh, also, it's much more easily organized and implemented. So these two second answers should not be forgotten when we discuss the future of a uh, vaccine program. So thank you very much for answering this question. And Steve, please start your lecture. Thank you very much. So I'm just waiting for the slide to come up. <clears throat> Next slide. Super. So I'm going to start, uh, I try and just uh, give you a, a background to perhaps help you understand a little more clearly uh, what you hear in the news about uh, uh, about vaccine development for, for COVID-19. Uh, I'm going to go through a few of the more basic points that I think are quite critical in understanding. And the first one, to, to be honest, is what's a vaccine? So uh, the aim of a vaccine is, of course, active induction of immune response to a pathogen. And there are really two components to that. You, 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 we often think of the antigen uh, uh, when we think about a vaccine, uh, but actually it's also important that the antigen is associated in some way with the stimulation of the immune system. And uh, the two of those go together. Many antigens uh, need some help. So the next slide, please. It's important to remember that um, there are many very, very different types of vaccine. 
what I'm showing you here is really not, not even thinking about what we require to stimulate the immune response. What sorts of specific antigen types are there? Um, and I'll just go th very quickly through this. On the left-hand side, we go all the way back uh, to, to Dr. Jenner. And uh, we still use the term Jennerian viral vaccines to cover viruses that are derived from animal sources uh, that uh, enable the human to make uh, an immune response Usually, it, with a virus that, uh, although it causes disease in animals, causes less of a problem in humans. And of course, the original is the vaccinia virus, which was probably derived from 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 from, from cows, uh, which can induce uh, a response in humans that will prevent uh, vaccinia. That approach is still quite widely used actually and many of the modern um, rotavirus vaccines are actually derived from um, at least partly from from animal viruses uh, the principle that uh, because they're not adapted to humans they cause less severe problems in humans than than the human virus uh, there are a number of live viral vaccines that are available um, and they may be attenuated in different ways a good example is the bcg uh, vaccine uh, that was uh, it was a, a tuberculosis uh, bacterium that was uh, uh, cultured from again from cows. You see, we've got a long association with with, with cows in vaccinology, and um, as was attenuated and has now been really the only effective uh, TB vaccine for some hundred years. Uh, also, amongst the live vaccines, um, I want to mention attenuated viruses. So. Often uh, we, we have many virus vaccines today that are, were produced by attenuation. Good examples, measles, mumps, rubella, vaccinia, all from viruses uh, cultured from humans and then passage through serial cultures. And of course, a virus will adapt to the environment it's in uh, by mutation. And so when, when they're cultured through uh, many passages, they actually adapt to growing better. You select for those that grow better in the culture, and they tend to be the ones that are, are more attenuated uh, for humans. And then the on the live side, and this is a very oversimplistic uh, classification, of course, I hasten to add, but viral vectors are another important uh, set of live viral, uh, live viral uh, antigens. So the principle of a viral vector is that you take a uh, viral vaccine usually, for example, a, a, a vaccinia is commonly used and also some adenoviruses have been selected because, uh, and developed in a way so that they will really be quite attenuated themselves in humans, um, particularly for the adenoviruses, uh, genetically changed so that they will not replicate in humans. But they will enter the cell and they will go through the early stages of infection within human cells, uh, but they also contain uh, the genomic uh, um, code for an antigen that we want to express. Uh, often, usually, of course, nothing to do with the original source. So where we use a vaccinia vector or an adenovector, the genome that's put in, of course, we're interested today, are, are genes from antigens uh, to prevent uh, SARS-CoV-2 infection, hence prevent COVID-19 disease. On the right-hand side, we have the non-live um, uh, vaccine categories. Obviously, you know, the safety issues are a little bit different for live and non-live, but many of the features in the clinical development are much the same. Well, I'm not going to focus on all of these today. Obviously, the, 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 the um, prototype sort of antigen is a protein over on the right, and where that protein is a toxin, it can be inactivated by chemical treatment and that produces a toxoid. Some great vaccines here, diphtheria toxoid, tetanus toxoid, you know, very, very effective vaccines still in use. Uh, inactivated uh, bacteria and viruses can be used, so they're no longer live. Uh, the flu vaccines in, in various ways, most flu vaccines uh, have been uh, grown as viruses classically in eggs, but then actually inactivated by chemical treatment. And in the case of flu vaccines, then somewhat purified. I want to mention capsular polysaccharides. So many bacteria 
have a uh, polysaccharide capsule that is a bit of an Achilles heel. So it enables invasion, but at the same time, excuse me, if you can hear a thumping there, that's my dog scratching her rear. Um, the, uh, the capsule of polysaccharide, if you make an antibody to that capsule of polysaccharide, you can kill the bacteria. So uh, that's been very effective and that's been adapted into conjugate vaccines where a potent um, T cell uh, antigen such as a toxoid uh, is attached to the capsule of saccharide to enable that to be much more effective in infants uh, and induce a better immune response. Because at the top, I want to focus on RNA and DNA. And, and like the viral vectors, these are ways of getting into the cell a code for an antigen. And what these three approaches share is the advantage, as indeed with some live, live, live uh, viral vaccines and bacterial vaccines, you get into the cell and you express the antigen of interest within the cell so that it is expressed in a, in a way that is nat the immune system is naturally designed to identify. Uh, and so you see two things, you see expression of the protein that can come outside the cell, be expressed and induce uh, antibody responses. But you also see the, um, the antigen that's produced, uh, presented or epitopes of it presented on, on the cell surface on HLA-1 and HLA-2 molecules. So the one thing that viral vectors, RNA, DNA vaccines have in common uh, together with some, some of the, the live, uh, live uh, vaccines is the ability to present the antigen in a very natural form to the immune system to induce both B cell and cell mediated responses. So I'll move on please, next slide. I wanna mention the word platform because this is a word you're gonna hear increasingly with, uh, with, with, with vaccines. And a platform is a, a shorthand really for an approach where you can make multiple vaccines in a very similar fashion. Uh, and a, a good example is the viral vectors where you, you, you know there are groups who have developed adenoviruses, for example, that can carry the genome for the antigen and uh, RNA vaccines and DNA vaccines. Similarly, when you're actually manufacturing these products, you can manufacture them in a way that is almost completely um, unconnected with the antigen you're trying to express. And that means that you can actually come back with the same approach multiple times to make different, uh, di different vaccines. Uh, I, I, have to, I have to confess that for, for Pfizer and BioNTech, um, this is the first time we've really gone a long way with an RNA uh, 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 vaccine. At the same time, BioNTech, uh, who's Pfizer's partner, um, does have work and has produced experimental vaccines on RNA previously, and that the manufacturing process is then very similar for new things. Um, the uh, safety profile is also often very much the same because what the body's seeing is is, is DNA, RNA, viral vector, and really very little impact of the gene that it's coding uh, to, to, to deliver. The one thing I should hasten to add is that there is no escaping the fact that um, even with a platform, even though the manufacturing uh, can be reused, we absolutely have to de de demonstrate the safety and efficacy in humans every time we use a platform approach. Next, please. Well, Steve, so I'll come back to a base. Yeah, go on. Yeah, hi. So we, we do have a question that came in that you might mm -hmm. want to take right now. Um, so someone is asking um, an example of vaccine developed by viral vector. And it's Dimitria mm -hmm. who's asking the question. Okay, well, I have to say uh, there are none on the market. Okay, that's the first thing to say. And that's common <laughs> That's common for all the three of those platforms I showed there, which is why uh, they're, they're coming through. But uh, there have been many, many um, investigational vaccines produced on the adenovirus 
platform. And that's important because um, you know, I, I've, I've worked in the past with the group in Oxford and they have brought through both uh, vaccinia uh, vectors and uh, adenoviral vectors for which they have already developed a manufacturing process. So although it's clearly being scaled up at this point, um, you know, they had the basic knowledge about that manufacturing. And the same on the RNA platform, um, you know, our partners BioNTech and the same for Moderna have already been working on the manufacturing process. And so although it hadn't been scaled up at the time, they're well forward on how it can be uh, produced and scaled up. I hope that answers the question. Thank you. So, so, so this slide here. So you often hear that a vaccine, a vaccine candidate induces antibodies. And uh, I, I have to encourage you to then say, so what? You know, lots of things can induce antibodies. And what does that really mean? And here I'm even assuming we mean antibodies in humans, because of course, you know, a lot of candidate uh, vaccines you hear about in the newspapers induce a, uh, an antibody response in mice or whatever. So that's even one step further off. Um, there are two key types of uh, antibody assays, and you need to look out for which is which. So on the left-hand side, I'm mentioning antigen binding immunoglobulin. So these are antibodies that can bind to a specific antigen. The problem is that you don't know that the antigen they're binding to, or the part of the antigen they're binding to, is necessarily relevant. And I'm going to show you an example in a minute of, of, of the fact that you can get an antigen binding in low globulin response that may not actually be doing exactly what you want it to. On the right hand side, we have functional assays. So these go by the name of things like, you know, viral neutralizing antibodies or toxin inactivating antibody assays. And these are able to measure, uh, clearly that it's not the same as sharing efficacy, but it's one step further on from binding an antigen to actually doing something biological that you think is going to lead to protection. Now, why do we still do antigen binding immunoglobulin assays? The answer is because they're relatively straightforward to, to create and standardize, whereas functional assays, each assay is fundamentally different uh, because you have at the heart of it either a, a, a biological activity which might be inactivating a virus, it might be neutralizing a titer, a, a toxin, but uh, actually is different each time. So there are advantages and disadvantages to different types of assay. I'll move on, please. Can I ask you something? A question came in, can vaccines lose their antigenicity? Can vaccines lose their antigenicity? That is, can they become inactive? Uh, in different ways, yes. Um, I, I don't quite know what the thought is behind that question, but certainly, you know, um, over time, like any biological product, you know, you can lose the biological activity uh, by degradation in a protein, for example. So yes, you can lose antigenicity. Um, I'll come back to the fact actually in a while that antigenicity may not be the whole story actually. Um, and so hold on to that thought. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. So this is now the next poll question, as I see. Can we ask the people now to vote? Yes, okay. I 
things that we could probably answer because now it stops a rapid accrual of answers. So uh, 68%, we have 87% uh, people voted. 68% uh, uh, voted for the first alternative that most probably the large scale production of the active ingredient of vaccine will probably become the bottleneck, uh, putting a large amount of vaccine into the clinical practice. 13% of the people find, think that the final formulation and production, and 19% that organization of vaccination of large population. I think all this, it is important that the first question seems to be in the primary consideration, but also the secondary question and secondary problems will cause a lot of problem to the industry. So thank you very much for the excellent answers, and I think we could now proceed with the lecture. Steve, please. Well, if you leave that slide up a second, and I, I would rather agree with this. Um, I think large-scale production is a, is, a, is a major issue. I think the way that companies are dealing with this at the moment is by taking a risk and actually starting to uh, scale up and produce those vaccines in, in, in relatively large quantities. Having said that, the ability to produce um, you know, active vaccine for billions of people is, of course, hugely challenging. Final formulation and production is an issue. Um, the world is basically running out of vials at the moment. I think companies are taking all the vials they can get and using them uh, already, and that's, that is a barrier. It was a particular barrier uh, for vaccines that require lyophilization. And I think you'll have heard, for example, that our vaccine is going to be uh, need to be stored at minus 70. And the good news is now we can actually put it to room temp or to refrigerated temperatures uh, five days before it's used, which gives us a little bit of scope to move it from very cold places um, to, to, to more normal uh, refrigerated environment. But that is a, that is an obstacle. Uh, you might say, why not lyophilize? The problem is that the world has limited lyophilization capacity too. So yes, I'm sure I that's think that you also okay. answered the first question. Yes, the antigenicity can be lost if this is not uh, well formulated. This is, I think, also, very much also relevant. True. Yeah, and I, I also agree, organization of vaccine of large populations can be a huge issue. And um, that, I mean, obviously, that's not in my purview, but I think you know, governments are already thinking very hard about how that can be done. So all important points. So let's move on. Thank you. Thank you. OK, what a horrible slide. So I apologize for this slide, but I'm going to make some points with it and I'll lead you through the slide. So this is looking at the antibody response to the S1, the, the S1 component of the spike protein of coronavirus. And uh, I think you'll find that all the vaccines being produced against almost all the vaccines produced, certainly the advanced ones for COVID-19, are based on binding to the spike protein, which is the bit of the coronavirus that sticks out and makes the beautiful um, halo effect after which the coronavirus is named. Uh, so this is the binding assay, as I mentioned earlier, and you'll see across the top B1 uh, and B2 are the two st structures or the two RNA vaccine candidates that we've looked at. B1 was based on just on the receptor binding domain, which is the tip of this S protein that actually binds to the ACE2 molecule for entry into the cell. Um, B2, which is the candidate we're actually moving forward with, is the whole spike protein. Um, and uh, th this was studied on the left-hand side in 18 to 55-year-olds, and then subsequently in 65 to 85-year-olds, because we know antibody responses are generally lower in older people, and we need to make sure that we're going to be uh, able to induce adequate responses in older people as well as younger people, because, of course, they are among the more vulnerable. And then underneath that, you'll see the dose levels, 10, 20, and 30 micrograms. And um, you'll see that there is, a degree, remember, this is a logarithmic scale, but you will see that there is, generally speaking, a dose response uh, from the lower dose uh, to the higher dose. And uh, then if I can just make you look at the um, 
the blue lines, the blue bars on the right hand side, this is the B2 vaccine, the, the, the spike protein RNA vaccine in 65 to 85 year olds. And at the bottom, you'll see the days of the study. So the vaccine was first given at day one, and then the antibody level was measured at day 21, so three weeks after vaccination. And you'll see that on these, uh, there, there is a response at day 21. Uh, so on that panel I'm asking you to look at, which is the 30 micrograms of B2 in 65 to 85 year olds, the geometric mean titer was 329. And a dose was given at day 21, and then antibodies measured just seven days later. And you'll see a much higher uh, uh, antibody level seven days after the second dose. And this wasn't a surprise to us. We, we knew that we were likely to need two doses for an antigen, for, for, for a pathogen uh, to which humans have never been exposed before, uh, because you're really starting from uh, immature um, B cells and having to go through a stage of affinity maturation in the B cells and, and B cell um, uh, generation uh, before you actually get to a point where you can then stimulate that with a, a booster response, which is why you see much higher response just seven days after vaccination. So that is a typical sort of uh, booster effect. I want to show you on the very right hand side in, in black, you see the antibody levels using this assay that we see in human convalescent sera. So these are sera taken from people recovering from COVID-19. We don't know that that's a good measure at this point, but it's the only guess we've got at the kind of antibody level that is going to protect people from future infection. Because despite a little bit of controversy about one or two possible repeat cases, very difficult to confirm, um, we do see that most people who have had COVID-19 are not going to get it again. So that's a good guess at what might be uh, a useful response. Of course, when you're exposed to the whole virus, you actually respond to many other antigens than just the S protein. So yeah, there are limitations to what you can make of that. But that was the Ig binding assay. So next slide, please. I want to show you uh, what you see in terms of neutralizing titer. So this is where you look at the ability of sera to neutralize the uh, the effect in in cells of uh, of of the virus. We use a particular strain um, of uh, of the virus that's been developed for the assay, but it's, this is what we call an authentic. Uh, neutralizing assay because it uses a real virus and has to be done in BSL-3 facilities. So it's, it's not an easy thing to do. There are also neutralizing assays that look at pseudotypes where you put the spike protein onto another virus, which can generally be done in uh, less secure capacity, but is kind of a step further away from knowing that you can really, really neutralize the virus. And uh, let's look again on the right-hand side the B2 at 65 to 80 year olds at 30 micrograms. And you'll see that at day 21, there's barely any antibody response using the neutralizing assay. And um, the, you know, 10, 10 doesn't really mean 10. 10 is, the, uh, is what we set undetectable titers at. So 10 is the base, the base titer, it doesn't really mean anything. And yet seven days after, uh, Immuno at the second dose, you see the titers rising quite substantially. Um, I want to show you that on the uh, if you look at the B2 18 to 55 panel, you see higher antibody levels. That's not a surprise. Higher antibody responses in younger people. Um, but we're encouraged by the fact that uh, and we chose the 30 micrograms um, it, it, to, to move forward with the B2 candidate because uh, we, we felt that that antibody response in older adults is probably good enough because it's comparable to the, uh, the neutralizing antibody response we see in human convalescent sera. It wasn't the only reason. You could make the same argument for the B1 candidate, except we found that in different ways, the B2 candidate was a little better tolerated. Uh, and, and so we thought it was a better candidate to move forward with. So, just remember what you saw on the last slide, where you did see an antibody response at day 21, but here looking at a neutralizing assay, which we think is more relevant to the biological effect, 
you see a, a, a big uh, lower activity where you see the initial response, but it, it boosts better. And that's because we're seeing when you, when you boost the uh, response, you actually see better affinity antibodies. I haven't, we haven't measured the antibodies, but we know in general with vaccines, you see higher affinity uh, and often class maturation that enables you to, to get um, antibodies that will have a much higher biological effect. So let's move on. One of the big things you'll hear about in, in COVID-19 vaccine development is the risk of vaccine-enhanced disease. And this goes back uh, to, to when I was born. So the year I was born, uh, which you can see by the gray hairs was quite a long time ago, 1956, um, the respiratory syncytial virus was identified, which is a major breakthrough. And there was an assumption that there would be a vaccine within years because we'd already developed, remember vaccines in recent times had been developed for, for polio and measles and so on. It was thought it would be a relatively straightforward step. And um, so a formal in and activated RSV vaccine was made. And when that was put into uh, children, all the children produced a uh, hemagglutinin um, agglutination inhibition antibody. And I don't need to go into how that works, but basically that was a, a relatively old way of measuring binding antibody. So basically an antibody that binds uh, to the antigen um, would, would produce HAA titus. So there's, there was good at, uh, binding antibody, but only 47% of the children who were immunized actually produced neutralizing antibody. And that's an important distinction. And then very sadly, when that vaccine was given to six to 11 month olds, 13.7% or a large uh, substantial number ended up being hospitalized with RSV in the subsequent RSV season. Uh, whereas um, uh, the figure in the uh, general population uh, was 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 much much lower, so we're pretty clear that um, the 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 disease was being enhanced by the administration of this uh, inactivated vaccine. Now there are multiple hypotheses why that might be, and it's never been fully confirmed. But uh, one of the important factors was the fact that. Um, when you treat the virus with the um, formalin, you actually retain the ability, you, you change the antigenicity to go back to the former question. So you can produce antibodies, but these are now antibodies to the modified epitopes produced by the toxoiding process. So antigenicity is a step away from the ability to make functioning antibodies. And uh, those non-neutralizing antibodies can do a number of things. So they can actually bind to the virus. And some, in some cases, uh, that antibody that binds, because it's not neutralizing, because its, its antigenicity has been changed, or its immunogenicity has been changed, can actually enhance uh, entry into, uh, for example, phagocytes without killing. Uh, so that may be an issue. Um, there was also evidence that there was a TH2 skew to the cell mediated response. And that was probably responsible for eosinophilia that was seen in the pneumonia in some of these children. And, and then another hypothesis is that you may get immune complexes deposited that in themselves we all know cause disease uh, because um, again, you, the, 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 um, the antibody combined to the uh, virus, but it doesn't bind in a neutralizing way, and then you get deposition of these immune complexes. So these are just hypotheses, but this is very high. Whenever we're making viral vaccines nowadays, um, we're very concerned to show that we don't have vaccine-enhanced disease. And uh, that's, that's a critical component of why we're doing such large safety studies with our vaccines before we get anywhere near putting them to large populations. Next slide, please. So, Steve, we have a question, mm. um, and, and the question says, is the Dengvaxia controversy a form of vaccine-enhanced disease? Okay. Um, it's, it's clearly, there's clearly a concern that it might be, um, and I, I don't think we can say that definitively. 
Um, but it is clearly a major hypothesis that's been put forward that when the vaccine was given to children who had not previously had dengue, they were making antibodies, as I showed you earlier, in a way that they were naive. So they were making antibodies, but they weren't necessarily strongly neutralizing. And when you, when you, you um, but when the vaccine was given to children who had previously been exposed to dengue vaccine, they were making a memory response. Now I'm grossly oversimplifying there, and it's still the jury. I think is still out as to whether what's happened um, in children uh, in countries uh, like the Philippines, where there was an increased death rate a few years after vaccination, was was actually that. But I think there is there is reason to believe it might be because we know that dengue itself when you get repeated infections with dengue, the subsequent infections, because it's got multiple different serotypes, the subsequent infections can induce what's called um, uh, dengue hemorrhagic fever, where you get more severe disease because you're actually, um, you're, you're actually skewing the response due to the previous responses to, to infection. So it's a hypothesis, not proven, um, but certainly high in, high in our minds when we're making a vaccine for COVID-19. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank Let's you. Move on. Thank you. So um, again, a, 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 not an easy slide, but let me just walk you through it. And uh, the reference is given here. This has been published on a preprint server. Um, so, so at the stage this was taken is not fully peer reviewed, but I think it demonstrates what we're thinking about. And this is looking at the cell mediated responses uh, to, in this case, our B1 candidate, which expressed um, the uh, receptor binding domain. And on the left hand side, you can see the antigen specific CD8 T, T cell responses. And you can see that these T cell responses uh, were strong in terms of interferon gamma and in terms of IL2, which uh, indicate a, a, a strong uh, function. CD8 T cell response, and on you can see th 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 these these are different to the subjects who actually were shown in the antibody responses. You can show in in, in T cells taken from people who have had um, uh, previous infection with SARS-CoV-2. You can see the responses are somewhat lower, substantially lower in terms of interferon gamma and IL2 secreting uh, T cells. Again, a little bit different because of course in people who have natural infections, there are many more many more antigens that you can express a cell mediated immunity including not just spike but all the other all, all the other components of the virus and then on the right hand side these are the cd40 cell responses and what what what's showing here is that when you look at the cd4 cells separate them out you see you after vaccination you see a um a strong interferon gamma response when you stimulate them with epitopes taken from the the receptor binding domain. You see a good IL-2 response, uh, again, when you stimulate those CD4 cells with, um, with, with, uh, with, with the receptor binding domain epitopes. But in terms of IL-4, and IL-4 is a, a, a strong uh, push, to, pushes things strongly towards a Th2 type response. So IL-4 really stimulates uh, more the, uh, some of the more, um, uh, it, how can I put it? Like eosinophilic type responses and weakly binding IgG, um, you see that that is relatively poor. And this is exactly the type of skew that the uh, regulatory authorities were looking for in candidate COVID-19 vaccines. And obviously this has been shown with some of the other vaccines as well. It's a, it's a good component to moving forward. Next, please. So I'm gonna say a little bit about efficacy studies. Um, so vaccine efficacy studies are where we take, uh, give the vaccine uh, to, usually in a placebo controlled fashion, to a general population. And then we follow for cases of disease and if the vaccine is efficacious and clearly we see less cases in the vaccine group than in the placebo group. So far straight forward. Um, Generally, we have to define a case very carefully. You know, in clinical practice, we can have different degrees of certainty about diagnosis. 
but for uh, 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 an efficacy study, you have to have a very specific and I prefer an operationally defined and algorithmic type definition that usually includes clinical features plus microbiological features. And I'll give you an example here. Um, this is taken from uh, a study that was done in the Netherlands um, uh, about 10 years ago to see whether pneumococcal conjugate vaccine could prevent community acquired pneumonia in older adults. And um, there were certain criteria. Basically, the vaccine was given, uh, the study involved some, I think, some 80,000 subjects. So clearly, very, very large. And you have vaccine efficacy studies have to be large because. If you've got a, an attack rate of say 1%, uh, or you have to clearly immunize uh, 100 active and 100 placebo to get even one case in the placebo group for comparison. So that's why vaccine efficacy studies are very large. And here they used a pre specified clinical criteria. They waited for people to be admitted in that population into hospital and then looked for radiological changes uh, associated with. Con them having acquired pneumonia in the community before being admitted to hospital. Um, and for microbiological diagnosis, this was tricky for pneumococcal disease because actually uh, it's very you, in, in pneumococcal pneumonia, you may find pneumococcus in the sputum, but that's difficult to interpret because a lot of people have pneumococcus uh, in the upper respiratory tract. Um, and actually very few of these subjects will actually have um, blood culture that's positive for pneumococcus. So actually a method was design, designed here that is not particularly useful in clinical practice, but looking for urinary antigen from the pneumococcal polysaccharide capsule uh, to, to, to show um, whether or not the, the, the particular vaccine type pneumococcus was, was, was in the lung where there was pneumonia. They, it did also use isolation of that uh, of the pneumococci from blood culture, but only a small proportion had that. So that's a classic example of a clinical features plus microbiological features. Next slide, please. Well, we do have a question on um, clinical trials for vaccines. Mm. And the question says, what are your thoughts on exposing vaccinated subjects to the virus in the context of a clinical trial? Well, uh, we, we, we <laughs> We actually encourage all the subjects in our clinical trial to take all the recommended uh, steps to prevent the risk of infection. Okay, so we, 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 we remind people they're 50% likely to have had placebo. Be very careful. Um, and to be honest, even when we put vaccine on the market, we will, we will encourage people to take all the usual procedures for preventing disease. I think maybe you're talking about challenge models. Uh, um, if maybe sometime if we've got another hour, we can talk about challenge models. Um, I, I think they're very interesting, but they're not necessarily very representative of what happens in normal exposure. So I'll, I'll leave it at that for the moment. So I want to introduce you to one concept here which to me is very important, which is um, the importance of specificity in the ca case definition for a clinical trial. And, and, you know, we've all taken this very carefully with the COVID-19 trials to try and make sure that we've got a, a definition that includes the uh, microbiological, usually PCR, um, plus um, the clinical features to define the disease and trying to avoid getting people in who might have limited symptoms uh, and coincidental presence of SARS-CoV-2. The reason that's important is I'll give you this example. On the left, we have, suppose this is, this is an example of a clinical trial with a perfect case definition, where in the placebo group, you see 10 cases of the disease, but in the active group that's in black, you've reduced that to two cases, and that translates to a vaccine efficacy of 80%. Now, in the middle, what happens if you have a, a, a less specific case definition? So, in this case, you see two cases in each group that are false positives. So, you think, so does it matter because it's placebo control? Well, you add two cases to the blue column, which is the placebo, you get 12 cases. You add two cases 
to the uh, active group, the active vaccine, that now makes four cases. But when you measure the vaccine efficacy on the basis of that, your vaccine efficacy is only 67%. So a poorly specific uh, case definition really weakens your ability to show good, to calculate the efficacy. Now on the right hand side, what happens if you have a, a, a less sensitive case definition? Well, then you take away half the cases on both sides. But uh, although you have to spend longer than getting your cases for the trial, it doesn't alter the efficacy that you calculate from those numbers. So that's why uh, clearly we look for something that balances sensitivity and specificity as a case definition, but the sensitivity is less important than the specificity at the end of the day in calculating the efficacy. Let's move on from that. I guess that applies to all efficacy trials for any product in any condition. Uh, disease severity is also important. And this is a graph taken from a, a, a rotavirus vaccine trial. And this group uh, uh, led by a, a man, a, a, a very well-known uh, uh, trialist, whose name momentarily escapes me, um, looked at disease severity in children getting diarrhea and looked at the uh, number of rotavirus episodes. And actually, in the milder cases, uh, there were not so many of these were, 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 were rotavirus, which is the, uh, uh, so, so, I'm sorry, let me re rephrase that. In the vaccine group, you did see less cases. In the placebo group, you saw more cases. But importantly, the differential was much greater for severe disease. So there were no cases of severe disease in the vaccinated children, whereas there were cases in the placebo group. Whereas down here at the milder disease, you saw, you know, uh, the vaccine group did reduce it, but there were, the difference was much less. So if you actually look at the uh, degree of protection against the vaccine disease score, um, you see this, uh, uh, the, this different level of efficacy. So Measuring using a, a case definition for mild disease may make it harder to see good efficacy calculations. And that's why we're actually looking for symptomatic disease, not just us, but most of the trials looking primarily for symptomatic disease. We would like to look for prevention of cases of severe disease, but we think there are too few of those to do it with a practically sized trial. Some of the trials are looking for prevention of just infection, but we know that uh, this, this issue applies to looking for asymptomatic infection. So really the regulators are looking for us to go this middle road, looking for prevention of symptomatic disease rather than prevention of asymptomatic infection, or trying to go for the what we really want, which is prevention of severe disease because the numbers would just be too large. And I'll, I'll hasten to ask, the, the, the name of the man who invented this scoring system was, was uh, Vesikari, uh, an extremely well-known trialist who's done many, many trials in Finland. Uh, next, please. Steve, just a quick question for you. I, we're coming up on the hour, uh, and and I know, we've, I know. we've got about seven minutes left. Um, I, I just wanted to make sure that you were going to be able to stay with us a little bit longer so we can, this is a fascinating topic, so just wanted to check I, in I, with you. I, I can certainly stay stay longer. Yes, absolutely. Okay. All right, perfect. So everyone, the webinar will probably run just a, just a little bit over, but uh, hopefully you're enjoying yourselves and learning a lot. So um, uh, just yeah. one uh, before you answering these poll questions, there came up a question asking why you should remember these questions were not asked to be exclusive. This is not an examination. Actually, all the questions are and all possible answers uh, carry a positive message. So the questions are probably you select the most important one, but please consider that all the other answers to the other uh, possibilities carry important message. Thank you very much. Yeah, so so we do have a lot of questions coming in and we'll try to take as many as, as we can during and at the end. And if we can't answer them, um, you know, live, we'll uh, we'll try and answer them offline. So uh, we're up to poll question three, and poll question yes. three reads: How will the efficacy and safety of vaccines in development against COVID-19 be compared?
Boas. I think we can go ahead and close oh, it out. We're at about 80%. Yeah. Yes, so the answer is the following. 70% voted for the first. Each vaccine will be separately compared with placebo. I think is excellent. But as I told you, we also ask it some other questions which might be important. The 8%, 9% of the people voted that uh, it will be, the different vaccines will be compared face to face. And then again, 21% of the people voted that several vaccines will be compared with placebo in a single trial. Now, this we know this type of trial, and I think that this is what the WHO solidarity trial also recommends. But I think we should listen to the uh, to Steve because he's going to discuss this problem in the next slides. Steve, please. Okay, thank you. So, yes, next slide. So, randomization is an issue, and um, uh, it, is possible, it is possible to randomize people in clusters. And I think all of you as pharmaceutical physicians will know there are circumstances where that can be done. Generally speaking, um, though, this is, a, this is a less powerful approach uh, than individual randomization, which allows trials of the smallest number of subjects. Um, and uh, again, you can do an imbalanced randomization, but actually that requires more subjects in the long run than a straightforward one-to-one -one individual randomization, which we're doing. It is possible to put multiple candidates against a single placebo, WHO are planning that, but those are quite complex to arrange and that WHO solidarity trial, I believe hasn't started yet. So let's move on. Uh, yes, but which will be, according to your opinion, the most frequently used uh, trial type? Um, well, at this stage, all the trials are individual trials. Okay, um, thank you very much. Yeah, yeah. So uh, I won't go into this. This is about case definitions. Next slide, please. And I'm going to talk a little bit about reactogenicity. We all know that. Uh, vaccines cause side effects by their very nature. And so we've worked out in the industry ways to study this very symptomatically. And we basically use uh, these days electronic diaries to record daily uh, temperature, dimensions of local reactions and symptoms in a way that's systematic. Because if you ask people just to write down the side effects, you get a slurry of text that is very, very difficult. Uh, to interpret and the FDA does have guidance in terms of how we do the grading and these are just calipers I show you standard calipers so you put these up against a local reaction and the number at the bottom gives you a readout for the dimensions so that everybody's using exactly the same way of doing it next please so I'm not going to go into this just that you know you know of course that the vaccines in trials for COVID-19 are relatively reactogenic um, that we see some fever some chills um, although some of the other symptoms those are very specific very little none in placebo uh, uh, but often things like fatigue for example we see in placebo subjects as well as in the vaccinated subjects so it's important to do placebo control but also very important to do this systematically next please Okay, sorry, can I ask a question because it's very relevant to it? COVID, uh, mm -hmm. I see somebody wrote it, COVID vaccines could in theory enhance inflammatory storm in some individuals as a disease per se can cause it. Since we have heard so many so inflammatory storms, this is a real relevant question. There's a, such a side effect yes. might be possibly expected. Yeah, yeah. well, and, and, and that's why we do phase one studies very carefully absolutely agree and so we 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 were 
were very careful. We did uh, we did phase one in very low risk young adults uh, with uh, you know very healthy. We followed them very carefully with certain number at each stage. So we followed it very carefully. I'm pleased to say that we're now up to um, having done a first immunization over 30,000 subjects without seeing such things. But uh, yes, it was a theoretical concern that we treated very but, seriously. But you did not find it. So this is now the last... Not so long, 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 but remember... Yes? Okay, go on. No, go ahead. Go no, on. I'll mention it in the next... Well, I'll mention it in the next slide. So go ahead with the poll question. Okay. So please, this is the last poll question. Again, uh, this question was selected because the broad public is very much concerned that under emergency registration, the safety and efficacy evaluation might not be correct. Okay, we are already. Uh, it is a more difficult question. The answers are very well distributed. Okay, I think we have now 57% of the vote, 77% of the vote coming in, and it's a very interesting answer. 32% of the people are afraid that efficacy and safety evaluation might be shortened below critical level. So this is a public are very much afraid of that, and here we see again that also in our audience, 30% are afraid. The second possibility is that you might save a lot of time by reducing the time needed for ethical and regulatory evaluation. That is true, but please consider that here you can gain only a couple of weeks, not more. So it seems the last one is 42%. No research and production development might be done in parallel. And this is actually most of the people are doing they are doing active research and parallelly they develop already the production, as Steve already explained it earlier. So thank you very much. We are supporting what we have heard. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Yes, well, obviously, the, uh, I think on the next slide, if I can just point out, um, we're all absolutely committed uh, to making sure uh, that what we put onto the market is a safe and effective vaccine. And yes, this has been done very fast, um, but we're doing it by compressing bureaucratic timelines. We're doing it by doing things in parallel. And it is true that uh, when we launch, uh, we will have safety data on about, uh, if, you, if you remember, we, we will have about 40,000 subjects, half on placebo. So we will have about uh, 20,000 subjects who will have received a couple of doses of vaccine. So that's quite large, but of course, it means that we have to continue um, looking uh, after launch at safety uh, as we as we wind up. So uh, I think the key thing is that uh, doing, doing large numbers for safety, then continuing to follow, and the regulators, uh, particularly the FDA, are putting in place very strict demands for the kind of uh, safety data that we show. And we're very, very strongly supportive of the position that they're taking to make sure that the vaccine is safe and efficacious. We are following I... cases for, yeah, go on. No, no, go ahead. I was gonna say, you know, clearly uh, re remember with 20,000 actively vaccinated cases, there is a limit uh, to your ability to pick up rare side event effects. And so, um, you know, issues like, you know, if, a, if, if, if an effect is seen in like one in 100,000, you're clearly not going to detect that in that size of safety database. That's true with all products. So we, you know, we will be continuing to follow extremely carefully. We will, uh, we will follow subjects in our trial for, uh, for at least two years uh, to see whether or not there is any effect on disease or on, on, on safety. 
Um, we may lose placebo subjects over time, but we will have ways of handling that. So I really just wanted to emphasize the importance of very good numbers for safety and uh, keeping, keeping our criteria and quality standards as high as we would for any product. So with that, I'll say, I'll, I'll leave it now. I don't think you need the conclusion slide. Thank you to 81 of you for staying on for this uh, slightly longer uh, period. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. And if somebody has questions, I think that Steve is staying with us for a couple of minutes more. Please go ahead and ask questions. For referring to the last slide, I just also would like to emphasize that doing parallel research and development is a tremendous financial risk for the companies. So we also have to give credit to the companies to do that. Yeah. So Steve, yeah. we do have a comment um, around, you know, funding and accessibility of vaccines in, um, in, in countries outside of North America and Europe. So in lower socioeconomic uh, countries that the World Health, you know, organization that the World Health Organization will have to get involved in making that happen, both in terms of funding and also distribution. Absolutely. And Garvey. Right. Very important organization. Yes, yeah, sure. No, I think that's absolutely right. And, uh, you know, uh, and, and the scale of, of manufacturing needs to match that need as well. Yes. And then we have another question, and the question says that there are many animal-borne viruses that can make up, that can jump to humans and cause future pandemics. Is vaccine technology moving in a direction of greater efficiency for us to respond faster? Which is very yes. legitimate. I, I think that's a great question. And the, yeah. the answer is that that's why uh, we actually um, think that platforms will be so important moving forward. So there isn't time in a pandemic to create a completely new virus, a vaccine. Uh, and having a platform will enable us to adapt much faster. You know, it's not a mistake. It's not, it's not an accident that the, the vaccines that are moving forward fastest are those based on adenoviral pl platforms and on mRNA platforms, where although there aren't either on the market yet, there are uh, companies and organizations uh, that have already developed the ability to make those those quite rapidly. So I know, you know, the, the, like the day after the um, the code for COVID, the SARS-CoV-2 was 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 made public, uh, BioNTech had already made the first constructs to start studying the potential use of mRNA. Whereas if, for example, you're gonna make an attenuated viral vaccine, it can take you years to actually attenuate that virus and it's really not practical. So I think the platforms are gonna be absolutely critical. And to give credit to CEPI as well, you know, CEPI is an organization that's been thinking very hard about pandemic preparedness, and they have been supporting a number of platform approaches to making new vaccines, absolutely agree. Uh, there is a question in reference to that. Somebody says that given messenger RNA vaccines, there was uh, have been successful to date do, did, because what he says is probably was never used in large scale clinical immunization program. Is that correct? No, that's absolutely correct. That's absolutely correct. Um, but I can tell you that actually, uh, for example, BioNTech, our partners, have been working with mRNA for. Um, over a decade and, and refining the approach. Now they've been, they were thinking primarily of its use in oncology, which is you know, obviously where the benefit risk is a different issue, um, uh, but they have used that to enhance the methodology to a point where they can, we can move forward. And we were actually already talking to, we were already working with BioNTech before COVID-19. We were working with them to make a, a, a flu vaccine. And we were taking much longer because there are existing flu vaccines. Um, so, so it is true that there's nothing yet on the market, but uh, we were already working towards that uh, before COVID-19 came. And, and, and so I think that's the answer really. And the question was also definitely related to Moderna because Moderna is also uh, used kind of a messenger. Likewise. 
very, absolutely, very similar. And they've also been developing it for other indications. And I know they also had been thinking, had been working on potential infectious disease vaccines before COVID-19 came along. Uh, and and that, that was important because both Moderna and BioNTech have had the ability to actually refine find the technology what you sh we show you is the simple concept of mrna actually a lot of details about how you structure the mrna you know what the 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 the, the uh, non-express components are the, the head and tail structure many subtleties about how that's made that had already been looked at before before this came along this this technology did not just appear in february 2020 it had there'd been a lot of work on it even though there'd been nothing on on the market. Certainly this will be one of the largest human experiment now with this new technique. Clinical Well, can I tell you, Sandor, can I, can, I, can I tell you, every new vaccine that's marketed is an experiment in epidemiology. And, okay. and, 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 you know, so any new vaccine that comes onto the market will have only been into tens of thousands of subjects. The technology might have already been there, um, but that specific Specific vaccine hadn't, uh, and also, um, you know, each, for example, conjugate vaccine technologies were only introduced in the uh, late 1990s. But then there are now many, many candidates available. So everywhere, everything has to start somewhere. But also, the other thing that's an experiment with every new vaccine is the impact on the epidemiology of the disease, um, because the vaccines one of the few treatment, few um, products that can actually change the global uh, epidemiology environment in which it's located. And a good example is the pneumococcal vaccines, where you have to constantly watch what's happening because the very act of giving people the vaccine uh, changes the, the ability of them to carry the, the bacterium and for, it, for it, the epidemiology in other parts of the population and so on. So you know, I think that's very important that once we launch a vaccine, we watch continuously for safety and efficacy practically indefinitely. <coughs> this, this shows very definitely is a different, a, a slightly different uh, concept of vaccine development as compared to drug development. Yeah, I think so. Please, uh, audience, are there any new questions coming in? I do not see. Please, if you have questions, this is a time to ask. Well, Sanders, Seema, yes. are there any other questions? If not, no, we can pass up. Yeah, I no, we, 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 don't, we don't have any other uh, questions that I see. Okay. All right. I think we got a lot of answers, so, and I think mm -hmm. it's time to close. Okay, well, I would just like to say that was an absolutely excellent presentation on a very relevant and interesting topic. Thank you so much to our co-hosts, as well as our uh, faculty for today, Dr. Stephen Lockhart, who's Vice President and Vaccine Clinical Research and Development Advisor based in the UK. Um, so also thank you to all the attendees and please join us for our next webinar on October 29th on the role of digital tools in changing health behavior. And if you would like to join our mailing list to receive regular updates on future webinars, uh, please contact ifappacademy.org at contact us. When you log out of the webinar, please, if you can fill out a satisfaction survey, very brief one minute survey, that will help us tailor topics uh, for future webinars. So thank you again to all the attendees and special thanks to our faculty as well as to our co-hosts.